This week we had the very exciting honor to talk to Jordan Walker Roth. Jordan is an actor on The Chosen and was on 1883. He also is a podcast host of the show What's Your Limp? When we heard about his show, we were because we're fans of The Chosen, and so I was kind of scrolling on social media one day and found this podcast, and was like, "Oh my God, Liz! Like we have to see if Jordan will come be on our podcast because it has so much to do with what we stand for at Courageously Kind." What's Your Limp is a podcast where Jordan interviews public figures, essentially actors, artists, athletes, authors. We like alliteration here at the A's. Um, <laughs> public figures that you probably have heard of and have seen in the media and instead of he talks about you know obviously what they're famous for but he talks specifically with them about their insecurities and the things that they're afraid of and it's got a really beautiful message that we're all afraid of something and we all have insecurities and anxieties and the more we talk about them the less scary they become and the more that we realize that everyone has some fear, the more courageous we can feel and and work together to work through those insecurities, stuff like that. It's really just so awesome. I really, really, really encourage you to go listen to it. Absolutely. And this episode, oh, it's one of my favorites, and I say that about everyone, but everyone <laughs> is a favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. We talk all about how to overcome our insecurities, talk a lot about representation of film and television, which you've ooh, ooh, ooh. heard us say before if you've been here a little while. <laughs> and I had to ask if he could give us any spoilers or teasers for the upcoming season of his show that he's on The Chosen. So you might get a little spoiler ah. in this uh, episode. Ooh. A courageously kind exclusive? A courageously kind exclusive. Delicious. What? I know, it's very, We want to jump right in and talk about your podcast, What's Your Limp? Where did the idea for the podcast come from and where did the title come from? Because we love the title really kind of hooks you and you're like, oh, what is this all about? So oh, yeah, could you. you tell us the backstory? So uh, it, the idea for What's Your Limp came about <clears throat> because uh, on The Chosen, for anyone who hasn't seen it, my character is little James and um, I'm one of the apostles. And originally the character was just, you know, an, kind of one of the sidekick apostles. And, and in many instances, that's still kind of the role of my character. Um, but he's the, the character was originally written to be there to kind of like help push the main character's stories forward. And um, I'm totally fine with that. It's something, you know, I love supporting roles and, and uh, I've mostly done supporting roles. So it's something that I felt at home doing. But then the director, Dallas Jenkins, uh, decided to embrace my uh, disabilities, which is cerebral palsy and scoliosis that resulted in a limp, and uh, make that part of my character, which was really nerve wracking at first. And uh, I, I was kind of nervous about it and uncomfortable because I was going to have to be like normal. I got into acting to escape um you know, my, my real life insecurities and issues. I can pretend I'm someone else. I can pretend I don't have a limp. Um, and I, I, you know, in most roles I've played, I've had to try to cover up my limp and make it less noticeable. So then for this one, it's like, oh, now I have to, I'm not pretending anymore. I, I mean, I'm still a different character, but I'm, I'm having to lean into it, uh, and, and put a spotlight on my disability, um, but when I, we, we first addressed that, uh, the character's disability, which is my own in season two. And after that, the response that we got from fans that, uh, specifically fans that have disabilities as well, um, they started reaching out and saying how much it meant to them to kind of feel represented 
and asking those tough questions because, you know, within uh, any faith system, whether you're Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or, uh, you know, Muslim or anything like that, there are people within those, those groups that have disabilities. And there's that kind of like stigma of like, if you're not, you know, there, I've even been told this, like if, if I'm not being healed, it's because I'm, I don't have enough faith or you're not praying yes. hard enough or all mm-hmm. of those things. Yeah. And that's always really frustrated me because, um, you know, I've known my grandpa, for instance, who passed away a few years ago, had a disease kind of like Lou Gehrig's disease that slowly mm-hmm. over the course of 20 years, um, just shut down every muscle in his body until it, it took his life. And he was one of the most uplifting, positive, faithful people I've ever known. So I'm like, no, that's BS. Like, you know, that right. you know, he's, if he isn't going to be healed, then that, that means that it's not a matter of like lack of faith or praying hard enough or whatever. Right. Um, and, uh, so that always upset me and, uh, I'm glad that we approached it on the show because we've had people ask things like, uh, you know, when is little James going to be healed or tell me like, I can't wait to see little James get healed. And I'm like, well, you may be waiting a while because <laughs> in order for little James to be healed, I would also have to be healed. Um, and it's, uh, that's one of my favorite things about the chosen is that it, it isn't afraid to, to ask those difficult questions. Um, and, uh, so anyway, that's, it's kind of a long winded way of saying once that came out, uh, deadline, the, uh, like entertainment publication that mm-hmm. do, does like breaking movie news and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, they got a hold of me and wanted to do a piece on, um, or an article on my character and also being a, an actor with disabilities in Hollywood. Uh, so I did that. And then as I was doing the interview, it was kind of a weird, I think this is the first time I've even mentioned this. As I'm doing the interview, uh, the, the reporter, or not reporter, the, the writer who was, who was interviewing me um, asked, you know, what, what's next for me, what I'm planning on doing. And I had felt that like, uh, cause I'd done a few other interviews and then this one was definitely the biggest one. Um, and anytime I talked about my disability and talked about my character, I felt better. I felt like empowered. I felt, mm-hmm. even though I'm talking about the things that are embarrassing to me, um, I felt empowered because it was like, I was take, it was getting rid of like the elephant in the room. It's mm-hmm. facing it, you know, facing your fears kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, as I was doing the interview with him, Um, I had been toying with the idea of doing a podcast. Um, Mm -hmm. And before then I had thought like, if I did one, it would be what's your limp because I knew that I like talking to people um, about their own insecurities would be an interesting topic, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, for a podcast. So uh, in the middle of the interview, he asked what I'm doing next. And I just said, oh yeah, I'm doing a podcast called What's Your Limp. And at the time I hadn't done anything for it. I hadn't recorded any episodes. It wasn't even like a plan. I hadn't (laughs) um, designed the logo or anything. But once I said it, I knew uh, that saying it in a deadline article that I had to follow through. So I was Mm -hmm. doing that to hold myself accountable because otherwise Mm -hmm. it may have just been another idea that it's like, oh, that'd be cool. And then I never would have done it. Um, so I was trying to force myself to actually do it. And then after that is when I, you know, just started cold emailing people and reaching out to people. And it started with, um, you know, uh, friends that I knew because I've, I've been doing stuff within the industry for a while and I've had friends that have had really good success. So I reached out to them first and my grandpa, who's an actor. And then once I got a few people that were somewhat recognizable, then it was easier to get other people that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it just kind of got the ball rolling. So yeah, that's that's how it all came about. That's awesome. I love that you just like said, yeah, I'm doing a podcast. And then like, you have to have yeah. to stick to it. Yeah. We had sort of a similar thing of Liz did uh, a video for Face Equality International, which mm-hmm. is an organization that works with different organizations uh, that are working for face equality and for the equality and representation of people with facial disfigurements and stuff like that. And I'll let you speak more of that, but yeah, I could definitely tell you were like more empowered after doing that video. I was like, let's start a podcast. Like, let's just do it. And you thought I was crazy, but I know I was like, I don't listen to podcasts. Like I, (laughs) where did this come from? Yeah. The idea of just recording ourselves was so weird to me, Mm -hmm. but I'm glad I said it. (laughs) 
have so you you're, felt you're, that too yeah. as well uh liz doing like um you know the more that you've talked about things and been out, outspoken about it has that helped your um like helped empower you and and help your confidence level too because that's been a huge difference for me absolutely i had a real hard time even just saying like hi i'm liz i have golden heart syndrome it's a condition that affected my face um but as soon as i say it i'm like oh okay it's out there yeah. even like with like meeting friends and things like that it was hard to know like how do we address it do we address it i'm really grateful for maddie she was always kind of my like encyclopedia <laughs> she would just tell people everything so i wouldn't have to um but yeah definitely speaking it and giving it not giving it like that hold over you yeah oh, it feels so good <laughs> yeah it does it's uh because and it's awkward too I've tried to put myself in the shoes of other people and it's so awkward for like I sense their their discomfort and and the awkwardness they're feeling when they ask like hey like what's what's wrong with you like wh why mm -hmm. do you walk like that they don't know how to word it or how to get it out and you know I, I could see how some of it I've never been offended by someone asking, you know, any of those questions, mm -hmm. even if it's worded, maybe not, not in the most delicate way, but mm -hmm. I putting myself in their shoes, it's like, you know, it is a, a tricky thing, like asking, you know, what disability someone has or whatever, just out of, you know, it, cause uh, usually it is from a good place of like, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to know um, if someone's okay, or if there's a way you can help them and, and right. things like that. But it's, I think getting rid of, um, the the stigma of disabilities where it's like of us talking about it more and everyone else it makes everyone more comfortable with just you know it's not a big deal to ask someone or to talk to someone about it or um you know like it, and also not viewing it as a liability not viewing it mm -hmm. as oh there's something wrong with that person so because that's why people with disabilities have a hard time getting jobs sometimes and mm -hmm. me as an actor had a hard time getting jobs because of it um so yeah i think that's awesome you know what you're doing i'm i'm uh i'm i'm proud of you for for taking that leap and talking about it oh thank you and thank you for kind of paving the yes, way for so many yes. others yeah mm -hmm. it's so important i'm just i'm trying to to yeah. do my part so hopefully it'll if it if it impacts one person then you know that's that'll that'll be enough absolutely absolutely Absolutely. So you touched on it a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit more about the relationship between specifically religion and disabilities. We've noticed it outside of religion, but mm -hmm. I know I've had experiences. We both work like retail jobs and I've had people come up to me at work and just start praying over me. And like, that can be a little invasive, but there's a lot of stigma and a lot of you know, like you were saying, you're not praying hard enough or you're not working yeah. hard enough. How do you answer to something like that? So I think that, yeah, faith is a, is a beautiful thing. I believe in whether it's, it's um, you know, people do different things, like whether it's prayer or meditation or um, even I think just being kind to people and sending that out into the world makes a genuine difference. Um, but when it comes to healing and when it comes to disability, it's, it's tricky because, um, you know, there are a lot of really charismatic, like faith healers. And I don't want to discount, like, I believe that, that, you know, miraculous things happen. And, and I know that there are people that have, you know, just kind of had things like where they've been healed from something and, and science and doctors can't quite explain it. Or, you know, there, there are instances of that, but I don't know it's, it's hard because if people, another aspect of like, it's, it's not a disability, but um, you know, it's like the idea that if you have a strong enough faith and you pray to be healed, like if I prayed strong enough, my limp would go away. But meanwhile, there's children who are dying of cancer and they're mm -hmm. not all being healed. And it's mm -hmm. like, I, so that tells me it's like, if that was the case, it would make me mad at God of like, like, why would you choose to heal my limp, but not these, these babies? And, and, you know, yeah. so there's all sorts of like weird things like that. So I think mm -hmm. it comes down to, um, not everyone is, is going to be healed for one nature takes its course. Life happens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, also coming to the realization that 
Uh, and it, it just recently is something that I came to the realization of that not everyone needs to be healed in the way they think they do. Mm-hmm. Usually our healing is more internal. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the healing I really had to do uh, before I thought I, I needed physical healing. I thought I needed to, you know, I, I thought I wanted to be different physically. I thought I wanted to get rid of my limp and that I wanted to be taller and I wanted like to have a certain body type and all of that. Um, and even still, I, I have uh, hints of that. Like I, I catch the, my reflection um, when I'm walking down the street or something and I see my limp and I'm like, oh, what? Like, and it, it, I feel embarrassment or shame or disgust. And it's, then I catch myself and I'm like, wait, why am I doing that? Because mm-hmm. the people I love, the people in my life, they don't care. They don't look at me with disgust. My mm-hmm. kids look at me and love, they wouldn't want me to walk any different. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one of those things that like, once I realized that my self-worth isn't based on how I walk or how I look, um, that I started to realize like, oh, I don't need healing after all. So I think for people within um, religious communities or that have a, a certain type of faith that are struggling with a disability or with the disability of a loved one, um, I would tell them, but you know, not everyone needs the healing that they, the type of healing they think they do. And another thing that I always say in like public speaking engagements is that just because you're, you're different doesn't mean you're broken. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that that has really resonated with me because, you know, you can use your, your limp or your disability to do good and to inspire others. And it may suck at times. Like sometimes my hip hurts or or I get more tired than, you know, some other people might. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like, that's a small price to pay if I'm able to make a difference in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that, um, yeah, that's, that's what I would, I would have to say about that. Love that. that. That's so good. That (laughs) that line you said that you're just because you're different doesn't mean you're broken. That's like, Mm -hmm. if everyone could just hear that every day, like (laughs) we'd all be, and we're all different. Like, I mean, what, what even does different mean or normal mean? It's like, exactly. All of us are, have, have things that, that we feel that make us feel alone and that like, ultimately we all just want to be loved and we want Mm -hmm. to love and we want to create and do the things that make us happy. And it's like, that's all of the insecurities and, you know, cultural norms or uh, standards in society or whatever. Those are the things that get in the way. But once you clear all that out, we all ultimately just want the same thing. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, good stuff. So sometimes when we're doing these interviews, I like need to like take that. I just like process all of the like <laughs> wisdom yeah. that people, people give to us. It's so good. Um, on this same sort of topic, you did an episode with your co-star Yoshi Barigas, and you talked a lot about representation. And um, one of you mentioned that uh, inclusivity has many layers yeah. and we were wondering do you think that like total inclusivity and representation is something we can achieve soon? Is it, is something that's not too far off or do you think we have a a ways to go? Yeah, I think it's, it's tricky because there are even just like uh, men and women getting like closing that, that gender pay gap Mm -hmm. um, within the industry. It's like if uh, there may be a, a film that stars like, you know, Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence or something. And then likely he's going to be paid significantly more than her. Mm -hmm. Um, But she's like this Oscar winning, like actress where, where, so there, it is kind of a weird um, system that, that we have. And that's not just a film industry, that's everything. But Mm -hmm. so even as, as simple as just men and women, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. But then whenever you add in um, like, uh, different races and sexualities and disabilities and all of that it becomes even more complicated and and um the gap becomes even bigger Mm -hmm. so i think though there are um improvements happening and i think a huge area that we've improved as far as disabilities is and there's still work to be done of course but 
uh, usually if there was a, a character with a disability, they would get an able-bodied actor to play the character and then they would win an Oscar for it. Um, mm -hmm. And there were some, you know, there's been some great performances by able-bodied actors playing uh, disabled characters, but there are plenty of actors with disabilities that could that could have played that role and brought um, even more uh, w like knowledge on what it, it's like to actually be disabled. Right. Um, <clears throat> and it, it would have been even more authentic. And ultimately that's what we want in, in art is authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, um, I mean, that's what makes the, the best art whenever it's authentic and coming from a place of, of knowledge. And, and um, I think that uh, they've started to to do better. Like Marvel, for instance, is is a huge, um, you know, the biggest franchise in in the world, and mm -hmm. they just recently, uh, Lauren Ridoff, I think is is her name. She was one of the Eternals, and she's a deaf actress. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have, uh, oh, I can't remember her name, but the the girl who plays uh, Echo in Hawkeye, she is a deaf. A Native American actress who's an amputee and mm. she is now gonna she's starring they're shooting it now she's starring in her own Marvel TV show as a superhero okay. um, so doing things like that uh, is is really important and, and there are people that you know may look at the Marvel films and be like oh they lack substance it's just you know the same thing which that's fine but mm. uh, there's no denying their cultural impact and if the work like we said normalizing disabilities and showing people that like hey people with disabilities are just as capable it may just look or sound or um you know seem different when they do something mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they can't do those things like I play football all the time I love playing football and mm -hmm. it may look a little different when I run but um I can hold my own with people and it's like I can still do it <clears throat> and I think that um in film they're starting to do that more and realize that that people with disabilities aren't liabilities and that they can, um, that when they cast them, it really makes a difference, not only in the way it impacts uh, the audience and people with disabilities, but the way it impacts the, the product itself, because they're bringing this whole new perspective to it that an able-bodied person wouldn't be able to bring to it. Right. Um, so it, there's definitely strides being made and uh, same with like racial equality and, and all of that. Uh, and I think the biggest thing that will change it moving forward, the next step as far as um, creating long lasting change would mm -hmm. be to put people in positions of power with disabilities or that are different races or, you know, um, having the, those types of people that are in these minority groups that, um, you know, have been discriminated against having them be like the heads of studios um, mm -hmm. or like the head of casting at Netflix or whatever. That's mm -hmm. what will make the biggest difference because otherwise part of me worries that like in, in the film industry, for instance, sometimes um, it'll be in for like the, the, their lead actors to be super ripped and like buff, like mm -hmm. in the eighties, it was like Stallone and Schwarzenegger, like these mm -hmm. giant yeah. ripped guys. And yeah. then it kind of switches to like the kind of scrawny, like goofy guys, like Timothy Chalamet and Adam driver. And it's like, mm -hmm. it, it goes back and forth. So there are trends that happen in the film industry where it's like, mm -hmm. based on what society is interested in, the film industry will be like, oh yeah, let's put these types of people in movies. So right. I do worry that the film industry is just like, oh yeah, people are wanting to see more uh, disabled people in film. Let's just cast them. And then eventually it'll fizzle out and then they'll mm -hmm. stop. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. But I, I think the, the thing that will make the most change is getting those people in positions of power. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm optimistic. I am I too. Me there. too. Yeah. 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 I think it's possible. For sure. Switching gears a little bit. In your first episode of your podcast, you talk a little bit about your experiencing bullying in high school. Um, one of the biggest questions we receive is how do you maybe show kindness to people that are unkind to you? Um, so we were just wondering, do you have any advice for anyone who might be dealing with that currently or is dealing with the effects of that? What would you, what would you say to someone? Yeah. Um, 
that's always been super something I'm super, super passionate about is, Mm -hmm. is, uh, bullying and like spreading awareness with that. But, um, I, I would say one that, and it's something I tell my own kids that like, if there's a kid that's being mean, Mm -hmm. it's usually because they learned that from someone else because someone was mean to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my mom always taught me that, and it did help me to, uh, it hurt at times being bullied. Um, Mm -hmm. But it, it's still, I, f- I had empathy for it when, and I, I'm not, I don't advocate fighting, but there were, uh, you know, I, I, when the bullying turned physical mm-hmm. at first, I would just like, uh, you know, curl up in a ball and wait for someone to break it up. But there were mm-hmm. times where I had enough and I fought back and um, I didn't, I wasn't good at it, but a big reason was because I viewed these people as, as other humans that are valuable and and that they should be loved and treated with respect anytime i fought someone i wouldn't like punch them in the face because i didn't want to hurt them too bad Mm -hmm. so i would like punch them in the arms and places or their chest places that they're not really going to be hurt but like Mm -hmm. at least i'm I'm pushing them away and stuff um Mm -hmm. but it was just like a subconscious thing i couldn't bring myself maybe if my life was like actually in danger i could but i couldn't bring myself to like hit someone in the face because Mm -hmm. i didn't I didn't want to hurt them, um, even though they were actively trying to hurt me physically and verbally. But um, I think, yeah, just humanizing them, viewing them as like uh, having empathy for them and feeling like, you know, they they've been hurt as well. So if I give into it and like try to hurt them back, um, it's not going to help anyone. It's not going to make me feel better. It's not going to make them feel better. But if I can just treat them with love and respect, then maybe even if they keep being a jerk, maybe down the road, it will make a difference. Maybe they'll be like, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. And I've even had former bullies reach out and apologize Mm. um, that have like started watching The Chosen or whatever. Mm. And um, I I think that it's, uh, yeah, just having empathy for everyone. There's very few people that I can't empathize with, I feel like, like, you know, there's people that adults that hurt children, it's really hard for me to empathize with. I can't, Mm -hmm. I can't fathom that, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I watch like all these true crime documentaries of like serial killers and all that. And it's like, I feel bad, not that it excuses any of the horrible things they do, but I feel bad for a lot of them when they talk about them as children being abused Mm -hmm. or whatever, because it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, I could see how someone in their psyche, like, because of all of that trauma could Mm -hmm. end up going down this really dark path. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think just having empathy for, for people makes a huge difference. And then also in high school or whatever, wherever you are, if you're being bullied, um, and you're a kid or a teen, um, my biggest, I guess, I guess, um, advice for that would be just to like, hold out a little longer and, uh, you know, just focus on the, the people that, that make you happy and that make you feel loved and stick it out because it will get better. It's really hard to see it when you're in it. Um, you know, I had suicidal thoughts. I, I didn't want to be alive because of how bad I felt about myself. And if I had acted on those thoughts, <clears throat> like so many kids do, unfortunately, um, I wouldn't have experienced so much. Like I've met my best friends after high school, my best friends in the world. I met my wife and we have three kids now. I'm on this show that I love where I've met a lot of my best friends. And, um, you know, it's, it's just uh, one of those things where like it, you, it's so hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I promise it, it gets better. Like the, I love the saying, this too shall pass because um, it's true. Like no matter what you're going through, it's going to pass. You're going to mm-hmm. get through it. Just like stick it out a little longer. So, yeah. Love that. Love oh. that too. Oh, so good. So good. Your empathy <laughs> is so beautiful. You know, because a lot of times we hear, you know, just kind of block it out. Don't listen to it. Don't pay any attention to it. But to see the humanity <clears throat> in the person that's hurting you is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, it does. Um, I mean, I think it's important for everyone to have empathy, but it, it helps you personally as well. Because if you see the person not as just this like evil person that's trying to hurt you, um, but if you just see them as a human that, is in pain, then it, it it's their words don't have as much power over you where it, it makes you feel more sorry for them where you're like, Oh, that sucks. They're in that much pain. They feel they need to take it out on me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, I think it's just the more empathy that we all have, I think, you know, it'd be a, a way better situation than it currently is. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm, empathy. Oh, we love <laughs> should it. teach we it in love schools. It. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right? Mandatory. Yeah, who needs, who needs uh, you know, calculus? Let's just right? exactly with empathy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, calculus. <laughs> Don't even want to think about math. I have to ask about the chosen selfishly. Can you give us any? What any are your spoilers? What's going what on? are your hopes for your character in the future? <clears throat> Where would you like to see little James go? And yeah. Do? So this season is easily our, our biggest season yet. It's um both in like the length because it's still eight episodes, but every episode is a little longer than mm-hmm. in previous seasons. So Rather than being, you know, 30 to 40 minutes an episode, it'll be 40 to like 50 minutes an episode. Um, So I think there's like 40 extra pages this season um, in the whole season. So uh, it's longer, but the scenes like we've been very, um, I guess, what's the word? Uh, Like they've been very public with the fact that we've done uh, the feeding of the 5,000. So Mm -hmm that's uh which it's kind of hard to hide when you have five thousand fans there <laughs> right. so uh, or we actually had 10 over ten thousand uh with like when you combine all of the days that we were filming wow. so um that was crazy but so that's a huge huge scene but it's it's and it's easily the biggest scene we've ever done mm-hmm. um as far as the number of people and how long it took to shoot but there's a lot of other sequences and and scenes this season that um are pretty maybe not as big in scale but the emotional stakes Mm -hmm. and the um the surprises that happen like there's a lot that happens this season that people are not going to expect um I cried four times reading the scripts and I hadn't cried in any scenes like reading the other scripts from the previous seasons not that I didn't love them but I didn't cry reading them this Mm -hmm. season I cried four different times and only one Mm -hmm. of those or no two of those times were because of something to do with my character but the Mm -hmm. other two were totally unrelated to little james um and uh yeah so there's it's super emotional as far as a spoiler it's not a real spoiler because dallas has talked about it too but uh i have or little james has a a literal come to jesus meeting (laughs) and uh i i confront jesus uh about um the fact that he hasn't healed me but he is uh, wanting me to go out and heal other people. Um, So that's uh, going to be a really interesting scene. Um, It's actually, that's the last scene that as of now, based on the schedule, it's, it changes constantly. But um, as of now, my very last scene that I'm shooting this season uh, is that scene. So that's the last, going to be the last thing, just me and Jonathan in this uh, super, uh, personal and emotional scene. Um, but I'm excited for that because I've never done a one-on-one scene with Jonathan. Mm-hmm. I like, I love him and I've spent a lot of time with him, mm-hmm. but it's always, almost always in group settings and being on set with everyone. Mm-hmm. And maybe I, I say a line to Jesus or Jesus says a line to little James, but never this long, like, you know, uh, sustained interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that I have that this season, just knowing Jonathan as Jesus, um, like the, the look that he gives and like mm-hmm. the Jesus hugs that he gives, <laughs> um, I'm, I can't wait to get to, uh, experience that firsthand now. So yeah, it's going to be fun. Oh my God. It's so exciting. It's so I can't exciting. wait to watch it. <laughs> oh, well, we're loving it so far. The representation in the show is incredible. It made me so, so happy to see it and be like, Oh my, I get so excited. <laughs> um, it's lovely. Um, and we're loving everything you're doing with your podcast. It's well, thank incredible. you. To change the world, man. Yeah. Oh, so are y'all. Thank you. I, I mean, th- it takes all of us to do it. So, and this next season should be out November or December, the first two episodes. So um, not too much longer. They're, they're already editing and, and we'll see. So hopefully, and the first two episodes, the plan is for them to be released in theaters um oh so gosh. it'll be like a movie and then the rest of them will start being released on the app so uh that's yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting oh that's so that is so cool. exciting oh, okay thank you so much for coming on before yeah. we let you go where can people find you and listen to your show 
Yeah. Yes. Um, so you can find me personally at the Jordan Ross on all social media pages um, or jordanwalkerross.com. And then uh, for What's Your Limp, you can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, and anywhere you listen to podcasts, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, or at What's Your Limp on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, uh, where I post like clips and stuff like that of the show too. So yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you so, so much for coming on. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank y'all for having me anytime. Yeah. Let me know. I'd I'd be happy to come on anytime in in the future. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Awesome. We'll take you up on that. Yeah, we will. (laughs) We were seriously so excited for this interview. We were like jumping up and down when he, and he emailed us within like 10 minutes. Oh my gosh. We cold email our guests which is kind of nerve wracking. <laughs> you never know how people are gonna respond. You never know what if, people are, if people are gonna respond. Um, we got our first rejection email the other day. Uh, Ouch, it uh, hurts a little bit. But Jordan responded know. within 10 minutes and was like, yeah, let's do it. I would love to be on your show. And that was so exciting. And it was even more exciting that he's so nice. Oh my gosh, he was so generous with his time and with his energy and his love. And we, oh, I'm just so happy that this episode exists. And that you get to listen to it. Yes. When this airs, it will be like a month or so after we filmed it. And it was one of the hardest things to not be like, let's put this out right now because I want people to listen to it. Literally the day we filmed it, I was like, can we release it? No. (laughs) We have to save it. (laughs) But it was worth the wait, I hope. Absolutely. Check out all of Jordan's amazing social medias. We'll tag them in the description below and at the end of this video. And check out his podcast, What's Your Limp? Yes. It's seriously so good. Even if you have never seen The Chosen before, um, he interviews all different kinds of people. I'm sure you've heard of at least one of them. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, go check it out. And a huge, 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 huge thank you to Jordan for coming to be on our show. Yes, thank you. We love you guys, and we'll see you back here real soon. <laughs> <laughs>